Should have done my hair. Yeah, I have hope this is going to be our, our best network connectivity bro chat because these uh, bro chats are always the worst. Have you started doing the other one yet? Uh, I haven't even. No, Flint hasn't even uh, actually uploaded his, like finished uploading his content. So that one may never see the light of day. Yeah. But, uh, hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Kodiak Shack podcast. Uh, today, we have Slander Entine, which we'll talk about him in a minute. Uh, but first, you are going to uh, get some of the admin out of the way. I guess we're going to get some of the admin out of the way. Either way, uh, please like, subscribe, and share uh, the uh, podcast. Tell your friends about it uh, because we want to get more exposure for the podcast and the people they're in uh, to uh, help expand the Kodiak Shack e ecosystem. So we've got uh, Slander here. Uh, he was, when I met him, he was a patch of the 55th. Uh, before that, he was in the 79th before weapons school. He went to uh, Korea. He went to Eglin after uh, being a patch and got into the test world. Uh, and now he's a fellow over in, uh, I don't know, we'll call it the Beltway because I don't know, I'm from California, so I don't know where all that stuff is. So uh, Slander, thanks for being here and uh, tell us about yourself. It's not a trap. Not a trap. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, that pretty much covered the career highlights. I've uh, been working on Capitol Hill in a senator's office for about nine months now. I've got three more months before I go back to the real world uh, working in the Pentagon. Um, you did leave out the glorious deployment with one Bender Page yes, and the exactly. Gamblers to Bagram nice. Air Base. Uh, and then prior to that, I, I got to spend some time at Kandahar uh, with the Warhawks out of Spengdala for about six months in 2013. Uh, so a lot of time in Afghanistan, no time uh, in any other conflicts, if you will. Um, but yeah, man, test was awesome. It's the promised land. Super yeah. fun. It seems like it. That was that was my number two choice out of Masawa. It was, or actually out of uh, McIntyre was F thirty five and then test, and uh, I went to Holloman. So there you go. But the Got the uh, landing, dude. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the uh, the thing I'm jealous about Bender because I did the opposite. So I spent a ton of time in Iraq and Syria, uh, and never went to Afghanistan. And then you did the you know Afghanistan only tour, uh, and Bender got a got to dip his toe in both AORs. Yeah. So didn't you end up? Oh, when you went with McIntyre, it was to, it was yeah, it was we were uh, in Kuwait Syria. and we're gotcha. yeah yeah. But it warmed back up. It kind of cooled off after, you know, it did that like crazy spike in, uh, what was it, 15 or 16. And then in like 17 into 18, it kind of slowed down again. And then sure enough, I showed up and then like it warmed right back up. And then the 55th swapped us out in uh, um, Kuwait and it was wild. They were doing like type three controls, AGR 20s for all my friends. Like it was, it was good. Yeah, Slander, you I know, feel the like AGR 20 uh, is like, Go ahead. The, the AGR-20 has got to be the most fun weapon we employ because it's, you know, you, you shoot the thing and then it's like 10 seconds of the most intense concentration out of the whoever is lasing it in. And then if you miss by even a little bit, it, you miss and it's all over. So that, that, that weapon was so much fun. Yeah. For everybody who doesn't know, AGR-20 is a old school type uh, rocket that they shoot from rocket pods. Uh, they put a laser uh, seeker on the front end uh, and that thing, I haven't got to shoot them, uh, train to them a lot, but I've heard they are nail drivers and you're either a, a champion or a fool if you, you hit your target or you miss. Cause... Well, Vader, you know that uh, down at Eglin, we tried shooting them at drones, right? Aerial drones for cruise I saw that. defense. Didn't you do that flight? Was that I you? did. Yeah. That was me. I was the guy, the first one. Uh, and it was awesome because the first rocket out of the tube hit the drone, took the drone out of the sky, and we thought we'd solve world peace. Uh, <laughs> turns out <laughs> Slander got pretty lucky on the first shot. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so it was tough to replicate, but boy, did we feel awesome after that. <laughs> yeah, I bet. The, uh, so that was one of those where like your your first shot worked and the next like 96 didn't. And it's like, ooh, that's not, not quite that many. But yeah, we <laughs> I think it ended up being like three out of 30 or so. Uh, but that was that idea came from uh, a buddy of mine named Spike Wynn. We were at WebTAC in 2018, 
I think on our second picture of Jack and Coke at the Nellis Oak Club. And he was like, hey, dude, why don't we just shoot those laser rockets at cruise missiles? It's not like they maneuver. And I was like, holy cow, dude, that is brilliant. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. So I went I went to war with the no monsters at uh, the test wing and ACC and everybody who said, no, it can't be done. It's too hard. You got to wait two years until the funding drops to go figure it out. And uh, with some help from Bam Bam McGarry, who is the commander down there and about five other folks uh, at both Eglin and Nellis, we managed to make that test happen in December of 2019. So 11 months later from WebTAC to test execution, which is essentially unheard of. Uh, so that was super exciting that number one, we like made the test happen. And number two, it worked because we're like, yeah, we did it. It's good. And then it, <laughs> <Yeah>. it wasn't. <laughs> Yeah. 30 Her, Her was, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, if it worked, if it was like, you know, one in six, then I can load up a Viper with 42 AGR 20s and it's still cheaper than shooting one Amram at a cruise missile. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that was the, that was the argument that Grizz Bear, he was the original project manager. He, that was the argument he made was as long as it is more cost and pylon efficient, than an AMRAM, this is an easy sell. We, we didn't quite get there. We were working closely with the uh, the engineers at BAE who build the Seeker and they were like, you know, we we could make some changes to the code. We think we can make this work. Uh, and then I, I left the program and moved on to other, uh, other efforts before I really saw how that went. But there were some other problems with um, the targeting pods are having a tough time tracking the drones over land so it only worked over water if you weren't pointed at the sun and the clouds were the right. And it was kind of like a niche case. And like, you know, the yeah. rockets didn't have a super long range because the motor only fires for about a second. Mm -hmm. So now we're having to rejoin a close trail with cruise missiles to shoot it. So it's like, nah, maybe this isn't like such a, <laughs> such a sweet deal after all. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I thought, you know, just put like a little mini like nine X seeker yeah. on there, you know, or, or even like a Lima mic, like just, just get them, uh, close, you know, and then rip it. But did it, has anybody yeah, ever tried Mavericks? Of... Uh, the <laughs> that would be did. awesome. So we, yeah, so we, we shot that drone down and then the 53rd wing did a huge press blast and you know, all the, all the big defense rags picked it up. Tyler Rogaway wrote about it in the drives so that, that made me laugh. He, he's always writing good stuff. Uh, yeah. And then like a week later, the Russians publicized, they took their Maverick ski and they shot down one of their old transport planes with a laser Mav, you know, and like <laughs> may, maybe it was coincidental, but I choose to believe that I influenced the Russians to go do something cool. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. <laughs> it's like the, it's like the space race. You're going to get them to, to go bankrupt <laughs> trying to keep up with their laser rockets. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, the, the great thing about that is, those rockets are only $30,000 each, which sounds like a lot of money, but when you compare it to uh, AIM-120 Delta, that's over a million dollars, you know, that's, it's not a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy how expensive these expendable missiles are, you know, it's like, man, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think I saw, I read, um, I think it was on the merge, but that, I think it was Taiwan got like, it's like 1.2 billion for an AMRAM contract. And I was like, we're spending billions of dollars on AMRAMs. Like that's how expensive these things are. But I guess yeah. if they work. I mean, a couple of fun, fun things to think about for the AMRAM. They, the initial AMRAM started its life in like the late seventies, early eighties. That's when that's when development began, um, and a lot of that code is the same now. You know, for some of the basic stuff like safe separation, you know, the sort of simple logic of how that thing works, it's all pretty much the same as the guys forty years ago writing the software. So, you know, I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But it's just crazy to think like, yeah, yeah, that's that's our latest and greatest. And I, I worked on the AMRAM program and test um, for a long time after I left the 85th, I went to a, 
squadron called the 28th Test and Evaluation Squadron, which basically does OT on anything that is attached to or released from an airplane uh, to include life support and jumps. Uh, and then they do a bunch of other cool stuff with agile combat support, they call it. So all your chem bio stuff, they, they do all the testing for that. Um, yeah, not I didn't do the testing for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. had civil engineers do that. Uh, and uh, the, the, there's about 10 guys that work in that squadron that are absolute national treasures because they are the experts in the world on AMRAM. And they just dutifully work on it. You know, there's a Viper guy, uh, he retired about 20 years ago. There's an Eagle guy, he retired about 30 years ago. Uh, and they're just brilliant, brilliant guys who know everything there is to know about that missile. And I learn something from those guys every day. And what, you know, the dumb fighter pilot would roll in and be like, hey, we want to do this. And I'd be like, hmm, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's try that out. Um, so, if you, you know, some of the guys listening or gals listening to the podcast might have heard about the um, extended time of flight stuff that came from an idea over a coffee like i mean surely surely the missile can the battery lasts longer than what raytheon is saying and we go like okay raytheon like no kidding how how long can it go and they gave us an answer and we said cool and basically we called it operation uncle rico uh because we want to see if we could throw an amram over that mountains <laughs> <laughs> We just, you know, we got a, we got an Eagle jet to get high, get fast, uh, loft, and it went real far, and it worked out just fine. Uh, and so that's where those expanded wezes came from, because we figured out there were some limitations in the, in the modeling that the missile uses. And we're like, hey, Raytheon, can you fix this? And they're like, yeah, I think so. Uh, we figured out there were some problems in the wezes because, you know, 30 years ago, they were like, nobody's going to, who's going to get at 50,000 feet and Mach 1.5 and shoot an AMRAM. And I'm like, ooh, this guy, I will do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's, uh, I knew when I was at McIntyre, uh, I don't know if you guys ever met him, uh, Robo Armstrong. He's a uh, General Armstrong now, uh, mm -hmm. but he's been around forever. And uh, he was the guy, you know, probably 30 years ago working with those dudes uh, on the like original AMRAMs. Uh, and he would always say like, the AMRAM will get there. Like, he's like, these engineers, the AMRAM will get there. Like, it's, it is just fine. Don't you worry, kids. You know, because he's like, as far as you want, just send it, you know. And you're <laughs> like, well, that's, that's, I have faith because Ro Robo's a smart man. The uh, Yeah, did you ever fly with uh, Freak Casey on a DCA sortie? Uh, I never flew with him, but I've talked to him a few times. But... Yeah, Freak, Freak had the same philosophy. He's like, way, way under conservative. Just, just let her eat. It'll be fine. And, you know, me being the fire in my belly, newly graduated weapons officer, I'm like, freak, dude, we can't do that. I have to point to the data <laughs> so these guys understand and then we can assess it and get our lessons learned. He's like, yeah, that's fine. But if we ever do this for real, like, you better believe I'm I'm shooting this thing wherever I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like okay, freak. Well, that's uh, – <laughs> you, you got to love those old school dudes like uh, Robo. Great. He was talking to Tron Bloom, which uh, Bender, I know you know him, Slander. I don't know if you ever met him, but Tron's a super smart guy. And he's like, hey, you know, Robo, I have a question. He's like, so I'm sitting there, I'm listening to the picture call, and I'm trying to like correlate my cursors on like my display for uh, to where red air is. And Robo's like, wait, what are you doing? <laughs> and Robo was like a patch, you know, probably went through in like early 90s. Um, and he's like, yeah, like I, I hear the, the bullseye of the bad guy. And then I put my cursors to that bullseye. And he's like, no, 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 no. You're all, you got it all wrong, Tron. He's like, what you have to do is know where you are and know where bullseye is. And then look out the window. And that's how you keep track of the fight. And Tron, <laughs> as like a young wingman, is like, <laughs> okay. Like, I don't think I can do that. But this is like back when uh, Tron was like, hey, um, did you guys ever like bust the airspace back in the day, you know, and it was like just pie in the sky kind of stuff. He's like, all the time. We used to break the airspace all the time. He's like, there just wasn't that much airline traffic back then. So nobody cared. And uh, yeah. it's, it's just great. Old school fighter pilots. Yeah. You, you gotta love it. Uh, I, I heard you guys talk to um, a couple of the OT guys, Rex and Blake. 
uh, yeah. about the, you know, all the great work that Rex is doing. And I, I remember when we went out on a road show and we briefed that we were going to get bearing and range on the air threat display, the ATD, so that you could use bra calls to target. And every room was just like, oh, finally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the engineers just had no idea that we wanted that for decades. And yeah. Like, oh, well, yeah, that's super easy. That's cool. A, can you, can you do uh, it? Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing that drives me crazy is because there's, you look from, from different MDS to MDS and they have these niceties and you're like, why don't we have that? Cause C models, you'd see it in like some of the publications, like, oh, they can use, you know, bra bearing range aspect altitude for targeting. And we're like, wait, we can't do that. And it's like, and now because we just asked the question and we now own the code, we can do that. And yeah, that's nice. Yeah. That's a great example of one of the benefits of how uh, some of the OT squadrons are organized where, at least in the 85th, we shared a secure space with the Strike Eagle guys and the C model guys. And so you walk into another room and look at their display and be like, what, what is that thing? And they explain it and be like, oh man, that is awesome. Rex, can we do that? I'm like, yeah, dude, bring it up at the Warfighter Council and we'll, we'll see if it gets any traction. I'm like, okay, cool, man. I'm like, let's do that. Or they'd see something, you know, Strike Eagle guys would see stuff that we had for, um, some of our seed work and they're like, hang on, that is awesome. Like, A, can we have an HTS pod? No. And then B, like, <laughs> can we, how do we, how do we do this like thing that you're doing? That's pretty radical. And we're like, yeah, man, like here's, here's what we do. Uh, so it was, it was cool to get that sort of cross MDS work. Now, you know, vendors find F35 that does all that work for them. So it's irrelevant, but. You still have the yeah, weapons, that's the problem. Us, Great, yeah. great platform. Can't can't do anything fourth gen that. slums. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the D gens and the fourth gen slums are just, you know, starting to starting to get there as best we can. Well the uh I just imagine what a what a HTS pod would look like on a strike eagle. Because the yeah. HTS pod is what, like, you know, maybe two feet long? Maybe three yeah, feet like long. Yeah, like six feet 77 long. Seventy seven pounds or so. Yeah. But you think about on strike you would look like part of the pedo static system, just like a little like airport coming out of there, but so it looks like uh if you've ever seen a B fifty two at red flag with a P five pot on it. It's just like <laughs> <Yeah>. absolutely ludicrous. <laughs> Oh, man, they need multiple, like, just because how long the wings are, you know, <laughs> geographically, yeah. it's not a good accurate, the, uh, oh, man, that's funny. One of the, one of the questions I always wonder, stuff coming out of test, so stuff that sees the light of day and gets publicized and stuff that doesn't, and obviously all these things are kind of, like, around or partially classified, like, who decides what test stuff gets publicized and what test stuff gets, like, we're not going to talk about that? Um, typically it's the, um, program manager or the, the test directors will be like, yeah, let's keep this one under wraps or, or let's not, um, at least when Schmidt Messer, now general Schmidt Messer was the wing commander. He was, he was pretty into strategic messaging. Um, and th there weren't a lot of sort of guardrails from you know, headquarters of what we should or shouldn't do is basically like if Schmidt said it was a good idea, then we'd hand it off to the public affairs team. And um, we had a great PA officer who just separated about two years ago and she would write the articles and it would like sometimes go viral, right? And you're like, oh, did we want that? Not, well, too late now. <laughs> yeah. Can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. <laughs> Could she actually identify different aircraft and ensure that they're U.S. aircraft instead of foreign aircraft, unlike yeah, most she PA? Was, she was really good about it. She would fly with us in the Viper uh, team often, and she would always laugh about, like, oh, yeah, I saw another base labeled a flanker as an eagle. I'm like, I just don't understand it. I'm like, yeah, well, neither do we. <laughs> it's not that hard. It's crazy. I mean, it, Holloman was so bad at it. We saw the, it was, it was back when, you know, they had the like wing splash page. So every time you'd log in 30 minutes after you actually attempt to log in, the splash page would arrive. And it was, uh, it was talking about like some medical side cause it was in 2020 and it's on one side, it's an MQ nine. And on the other side, it's a flanker. 
uh, and we're like not even close. Like you couldn't, I get it if it's like where a C model base may be and you just didn't realize, but it's, it's supposed to be an F-16. And it was, it was a like Su-27 or something. I was like, get out of here. Like this is, it's almost like they're doing it on purpose just to mess with us. But, it's a gen- you know. Yeah, may, maybe so. You know, yeah. it just happened yesterday. Uh, I forget some, one of the COCOM's official Twitter page tweeted out happy birthday Air Force and it was a flanker. And I was just like, nice. Yeah. Way That's to go. Solid. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, th- I saw an article uh, that was the Ukrainians saying congratulations, like United States Air Force, and it had a Ukrainian fighter and a U.S. fighter, and it labeled them correctly. And it's like, gosh, the Ukrainians can do this, uh, but we can't. Well, did you guys see the yeah. one out of Nellis? I can't remember if it was a 35 taking off and they called it a Raptor or a Raptor taking off, but they called it a 35. And uh, do you guys remember which, which one it was? I no, think it was I a 35 thing. I mean, at least they're like Raptor. Yeah, yeah that's that's not right. Yeah, but it was one of those where it's like, oh, the majestic F-22 taking off in an <laughs> evening, like LFE, and uh, and then you see like one afterburner, and it's like very apparent that there's only one motor, and you're like, sure, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, so kind of uh, I want to figure out how you ended up getting to the fellowship stuff. So obviously you're at test. And you're like, hey, I want to go. Because is this part of your PME, like professional military education stuff? Yeah, this is, uh, it is IDE. So this is, this is my PME. Uh, so when the, you know, I forget what the website is that you put in your dream sheet for school. And I put down, I, I in my 14 years in the military, I've decided that I want to pick where I live over what I do because I'll find a way to be happy if I'm happy with where I live. So uh, we wanted to we wanted to get a little change of pace from the Panhandle of Florida. I, I wanted to get up to D.C. We really like D.C. Um, it's just a lot to do. It's a fun city, great food and bar scene, five, six professional sports teams. Uh, it's a super cool town. So I picked D.C. fellowships. I did not want to go to Maxwell despite the Air Force's desires to make Maxwell, you know, more appealing. It's not to me. I've, I've spent time in, you know, small, primarily military towns around the country, and they're great. I just wanted something different. I'd never lived in a big city. Um, so I just put down uh, the DARPA fellowship was my top choice. This was my second choice. And then the they used to have it. They don't have it anymore, the CAF fellowship, where fighter pilots would go do a year as a fellow on a staff somewhere and then a year as a staff officer and that would count as their staff tour and their IDE. So I put that at the half and then at Langley was my number two choice. Um, And I can't remember what the other ones were. And so originally I got selected for the CAF fellowship at Langley and I was like, ah, man, that's like, I I felt like I was in a play in tournament for the, for the big dance in March madness. I was like, I don't know whether I want to do it, you know, because I really made, my decision about staying in the Air Force or getting out based on whether I got a fellowship I wanted. If I didn't get a fellowship I wanted, that was, you know, the Air Force saying thanks, but no thanks to me. Um, So that was sort of, that was the one that was the cut line. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. And I decided I was going to do it. Uh, So I, I took the blood money. I signed the bonus for five years to run concurrent with the commitment for going to school. And then about three months later, my wing commander called me and he was like, Hey man, you want to go to DC and do the legislative liaison fellowship instead, which was the number two choice on my dream sheet. And I said, well, you know, kind of, I got to, you know, talk it over and figure out what's best for us. Um, and eventually I was like, yeah, let's do it. Not realizing that it, this is actually an 18 month fellowship with what's supposed to be a two year payback that's auto waived to one year, but then they can waive it even further uh, by the, the secretary can waive it altogether uh, for a command opportunity. So I, I'm in my third look trying to figure out how this is going to go down, uh, so to speak. And they just gotten rid of below the zone. And I'm like trying to figure out how am I going to like fit in command, whatever. And I was like, you know what, dude, like that's somebody else's problem. I want to go to DC. I've already, I've always had, uh, 
you know, pretty strong interest in national politics, not to ever run for office, but just, you know, what's going on in, in Congress? What's going on in, on the policy side? When else am I going to get an opportunity to work as a personal staffer, but still make my Air Force officer salary? Never is the answer. This is the time. Uh, so, you know, we decided we were going to do it, and here we are. Uh, and it's been super awesome. You know, it's not all it's not all strikes, right? Like, some days are not great. Some days are super frustrating. Some days are boring. Some days are really exciting. Um, but the experience has been phenomenal. I mean, I, I work for a senator on the Armed Services Committee, and so anytime there's a nominee to be like a, a COCOM commander, that general is going to show up in our office for an office call. And so the senator is very gracious and lets me sit in the room. And, you know, I sit there in my suit and tie with my F-16 lapel pin, because if I don't tell people I'm a fighter pilot, they won't know, and that's not okay with me. Uh, <laughs> obviously obviously so uh, i'll sit there in the room and and the boss will ask questions and it's fascinating to see these you know combatant commanders there's not a lot of them right uh and very deferential of course to an elected official and then at the end of the meeting the boss will turn to me and go okay slander what did i miss what do you want to ask dude, nothing dude like are you kidding no i'm not gonna <laughs> like <laughs> yeah i think you covered it all <laughs> You got to ask something. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, we can feed you some questions well, you know, the next time. Yeah. 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 Well, so it's funny you mentioned it because obviously I've got bros around the calf. And so I'll reach out and be like, hey, what do you want, what do you want to ask this person? Uh, one of the things that I'll do is prepare the boss for hearings and those meetings. And so part of that prep is drafting questions. And, um, you know, some of you may be familiar with the debacle with Link 16 between the Air Force and the FAA this year, coupled with the crypto mandate from the NSA, where nobody was getting keys for the legacy systems, but the FAA wasn't approving the transmitting for the new system. So basically nobody had Link 16, right? So I'm like trying to get the boss excited about it. And this is, as they say, in the weeds. <laughs> he, he, or she, yeah. he does not care. He's like, what's Link 16 and why do I care? Well, it's like, find my friends, but like way better. And we really, really need it and we don't have it. <laughs> and so I would keep putting these questions in and he would never ask them. And eventually we're walking back from a hearing and he just said, please, I, I get it. This is important to you. Just work with the professional staffers on the committee and figure this out and let me know if you need help. And at that point it was sort of, becoming moot so we figured it out but you know I, i'll reach out like hey what do you what do you want to ask uh what do you think so if you guys got questions for guys that are up for nominations send them my way you know <laughs> yeah that's cool that is cool well, and, and that, that's the tough part because i always feel like that's exactly the case is we're and we're the operator we are have an intimate knowledge about all these um systems and aircraft and what we actually need. And then the people who actually get to decide on them and ask the questions, uh, are they are, they are informed, but not informed in the same way. And so they don't, they don't realize how, how much of a game changer. I mean, obviously I'm at the, the Fresno guard right now and they just hearing them talk and they're like, well, when we had link 16, you know, and it's just, it's just like huge issue for like it, it you're, one arm, maybe both arms, you know, just of like the SA you can gain and everything. So it's as at least fourth gen, you know, fifth gen is probably just fine with that link 16. But, uh, <laughs> but the, it's just, it's a struggle and it, it would be nice if they had a better understanding. Like it'd be nice if you could be like, Hey, come look at my tapes. And now we can, you can see just the difference between, you know, turning on and off that light switch. Yeah. You know, um, the electric officials are really, really busy. And he sits on a couple other committees besides armed services. So he, he doesn't have the ability to devote the amount of attention required to have a deep understanding of all of the systems and all of the services, right? So what's really good is that in addition to the personal staff, so I work on the personal staff and there's a few other folks that focus on national security on the personal staff. 
the armed services committees, both on the House side and the Senate side, have staff that work for the committee. So if you've ever heard somebody talk about a PSM, that's a professional staff member. So they are, they are hired by either the ranking member who's in the minority or the chairman, their staff, and they all they do is focus on really, really getting into the weeds. So that person or those people, they're the ones that will go over to the Pentagon and have meetings with the, you know, the half or whoever and say, hey, what's going on with Link 16, which is what happened, right? So they're, they're having meetings. And then if it becomes an issue that they can't handle, then they'll bring it up and either get the, you know, staff director who works very closely with the chair or the ranking member. And they, you know, that the staff director is the type of person who can request the chief of staff of the Air Force to call and the chief of staff will move his calendar around to call the staff director um, or the secretary or the under. So when the staff director gets involved, people really pay attention. And then if it gets really gross and you have a senator call and the senator is going to call the secretary of defense or the undersecretary of defense and say, what are we doing about this? And and that those individuals do not like it when these things get to them. So um, rest assured, there are people who are very much in the weeds that are advising the members of the committee on things like this. And there's also uh, what I've seen, which has been really, really interesting, is that there are senators who really, really get it and really, really care about systems. So uh, one of the things that has been a hot topic this year is the nuclear armed sea launch cruise missile. So cliff notes, think about a tomahawk sized missile that has a low yield nuclear weapon on it that could be launched from any vessel with a vertical launch system, be it surface or subsurface, right? This year's nuclear posture review advocated that that capability not be continued to be funded. A lot of senators were not happy about that. So in yeah. many, many hearings during the budget, they call it the posture hearings, where all the all the bobs, all the mega bobs from the DOD come over the hill and defend the budget. You get questions to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the STRATCOM commander. Is it your best military advice to continue developing slick Ahmed, sea launch cruise missile? Yes. All of them to a person said yes. And then you get to the political appointees and they say no. And so you you end up with this weird sort of uh, awkward tension because the military people are like, no, no, we definitely need to do this to provide options to the president. And the political appointees from the administration have made a policy decision, as is their right, to say, no, we're not doing this anymore. And that is our policy decision. So um, in that debate, both in open and closed classified settings, you see that the senators are really well versed in non-proliferation, nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence, and it's it's really fascinating to see. So so I, I don't know, you know, I think it's just personal preference who cares about which topic, but certainly different members care about different topics more or less. Uh, so like Senator McSally from Arizona a few years ago, she flew A-10s and cared a lot about the A-10, which is why we have so many A-10s still, right? Um, but different senators now care about different things. So it's it's not that they don't care. It's not that they can't get the knowledge. It's that what rises to the level of requiring a senator a senator's attention is very different than what you or I might think is the most important thing. Uh, so that, that's been an interesting lesson to learn. You know, it's it, it's working for working for a senator is like working for a four star plus, right? They're super busy. He spends a ton of time doing things that I don't I don't know. I don't know what they are. I don't know why they're important. You know, they're for other committees or he's meeting with people for various reasons. I, I don't know. He's got meetings on his books. I don't know who they are. He's his calendar that I've seen is packed from eight AM to ten PM most days and he's traveling every weekend. So if I can get 45 to 60 seconds of an elevator pitch in an actual elevator, I, I better have my stuff wired tight if I'm going to bring it up to him. And I better know what I need him to do other than like have him go, okay, slander, which is, that's kind of a, a bummer when that happens. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, it's good to hear that because, you know, the one thing I know is that I don't understand the process and I don't understand the space. So it's good that we have guys much like yourself that are end user operators, smart guys who can be there and provide input, but also just do a good job to help, um, the process is there because I assume they've got you working on a lot of random things that are beyond being a fighter pilot, but it, it's going to make you more holistically better as you move forward, wherever you end up going. Yeah. I, I don't know that I would call myself a smart guy. I, I certainly work hard. Uh, I do very little things that are fighter pilot -y other than the, you know, personality traits of a fighter pilot of I'm going to, work hard to do a good job the first time and be accurate with what I work on and try not to embarrass myself through gross buffoonery. Um, I think I'm doing okay so far. We'll see. We'll see how it goes after this podcast gets posted. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys please tell me there's some gross buffoonery there that you get a chuckle at every once in a while, not from yourself, but from others, I assume. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, Got a uh, there was a, there was a senator who was talking about artificial intelligence and whoever wrote his questions didn't use a great typeface because he kept referring to it in a hearing as a one technology. And I was like, Oh buddy, <laughs> that, that's not where you want to be. <laughs> talking about that steak sauce. I love yeah. it. Yeah. 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 He's good sauce. He, <laughs> Yeah. Artificial intelligence or A1 uh, technology, like, oh, oh no, <laughs> this isn't great. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be a long three to five minutes or whatever it was. The, yep. Well, the, yeah, um, so I, I was going to, we can talk a little bit about the process if you want. Um, just like a yeah. top level, you know, one of the things that I sort of knew but didn't really understand, um, the department has a significant amount of control. The Department of Defense has a significant amount of control what goes into each year's NDAA. So, you know, you, we all talk about the POM and we all talk about the president's budget. People forget, at least I did, that the official name of that document is the president's budget request. So, I'm sorry, before you keep going, what's the POM and NDAA, just to break those acronyms down? Sure, you know. yeah. So the POM is the Program Objective Memorandum, which is um, basically the Air Force's budget gets put into, so from start to finish, right? At the beginning of a budget cycle, Congress is going to pass something called a budget resolution, or at least they're supposed to. Sometimes they don't. Uh, and that's going to set the top line budget for the Department of Defense based on what Congress says. At that point, it goes to uh, what's called the Office of Management and Budget, and they manage the budget for the entire executive branch. So every executive branch agency sends their budget to OMB. OMB sends it to Office of Secretary of Defense, and they say, here's your top line. So for 2022, I think it was $775 billion, something on that order. Yeah. Crazy number. Right. Yeah. And everybody got super upset about that number because it was essentially flat with no increase for inflation over last year. So everyone uh, in the defense media space called it a cut. Uh, the minority party referred to it as a cut. So then at OSD, they basically take that budget and they break it into thirds with this is a little bit of hand waving, but they break it into thirds for the army, the Navy and the air force. And then there's something called the fourth estate, which is everybody else. Uh, so that's your research and engineering people. That's, you know, the Pentagon has some fourth estate entities. That's uh, this, uh, so that they break the budget into thirds and then the air force goes, okay, great. Our top line budget is $230 billion or so. And then they, figure out where that's going to go. And so, so, so it's, it's a zero sum game uh, at that point. So if you want to buy more airplanes, more F-35s or F-15 EXs or C-130Js or whatever, you have to take money from something else because down, they call it the engine room in the Air Force. They literally just like move the slides or move the cell over for the next year's 
Excel spreadsheet. And they, they do that five years out, which is the five-year defense plan for the FIDA. So you go, okay, I want to buy more F-35s. What am I going to cut from? And so that's called an offset, and you figure out that offset. So the Air Force is churning on that right now. Once the Air Force has its budget, it goes back to Office of Secretary of Defense. And then CAPE, the Cost Analysis and Program Evaluation Office, takes a look at all the services budget budgets to make sure that there's not excessive overlap uh, and it all kind of makes sense from their angle. They make their recommendations that goes to the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Dr. Hicks can take her red pen and start all over and take all of that work that we did in all the services and say, I don't like it. And then it goes to Secretary Austin and he can do the same thing. And then it goes to, back to OMB and they can do the same thing. And then the president signs off on it and that becomes the president's budget request. And that's the starting point. That's the opening bid in Congress, right? So that's where we are right now is the budgets are all with CAPE and they're doing their analysis. And the president is supposed to send his budget by law on uh, the, in the first week of February. It often doesn't happen and nobody cares. So separately from the budget, there's something called the NDA, the National Defense Authorization Act. That is supposed to be policy. So that is things like um, the repealing don't ask, don't tell could have gone into an NDAA. Things like, oh, we're gonna create a space force. That was in an NDAA. The budget is separate. So the authorization says, hey, Department of Defense, you are allowed to spend X number of dollars on this program. And, and for the Department of Defense, it's unlike most of the other executive branch departments, it's a line by line accounting. So for every thing you do in the military, Congress has a authorized money for you to do that. So that's flying hours, that's maintenance, that's uh, pay, allowances, you name it. There is a line in the law that says this is how much it is. And then there's a bunch of other stuff in there. So congressional required reports or, hey, we're going to change the federal law that requires you know, for example, don't quote me on it. I think that the cybersecurity awareness training is a federal law that we have to do it. Senate? So, <laughs> yeah. So somebody could go like, nah, I don't think that's important anymore. Let's take it out. And so it could go up. It could be removed. The defense appropriations bill comes from a whole separate number of committees called the appropriations committees. So the best analogy I can offer is say, say, you're back in middle school and you go to your, your parents and, and you say to one parent, hey, I would like to go to the movies. Can I have $20 to go to the movies? That's your, that's your budget request. Your parent says, I'll give you $25 because I want you to get some candy and popcorn. Great, I'm now authorized to spend $25. Then you go to your other parent and you say, hey, I've been approved to spend $25. And they can say, here's $25, and now you've been appropriated $25. They can also say, here's $15, you don't get your candy and popcorn. Or they can say, here's $30, I want you to get a big popcorn and a soda. And so the appropriations is where the actual check is written. The authorization is where the policy and the approval to spend money is. So when you see things like, oh, the NDAA has an $820 billion budget, it's interesting but ultimately irrelevant because what really matters in terms of the dollar amount is what the appropriations committees come up with what is what is historically uh if you know wh where does that fall normally like are they in the ballpark of what they get uh appropriated versus approved kind of thing i mean it, it changes every year yeah. typically but I mean, the is it a, authorizers course. are higher than the appropriators because it's funny money nobody cares right like yeah, That's we're going to buy 150 F-35s this year. And the appropriators are like, with what money, dude? No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so does, no. do the appropriators so, work with, so that the NDAA gets approved, they go line by line through that to approve what gets funded, or do they have their own separate document list? They have their own stuff? separate document. Yeah, so you can, you can actually go look at them. If you look up on the... Uh, under Secretary of Defense Comptroller's website, they have what's called the J books, the justification books. And you'll see everything in the military has a, a minimum of one page that says, hey, we would want to spend this number of dollars on this thing. 
and you'll see the line number and then you can go find in the appropriations bill line 69 whatever it is you know x number of million or billion dollars is appropriated for these things um so you can like for for the fighter pilots you can go figure out like hey what does the air force want to spend money on for the f-16 or the f-15c not much anymore uh the f-15 ex the f-22 f-35 and so you can see what they're asking for obviously it's not going to be every class that capability but it's sort of a broad brush and then the professional staffers on the appropriations committees will have their own conversations with the department say like hey what what is this about uh, and there's a lot more to it, right? Like lobbyists get involved and interest groups get involved. And in some cases, you know, members care about their home district or there's a factory in their district that they care about. Um, so F-35 has parts sourced, I think, in all 50 states, which is pretty smart because uh, now everybody cares. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, did that answer your question? Hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, it does. It just makes the, I mean, the NDAA just seems like, I think you kind of mentioned this when we initially talked about it. It's kind of a a posturing document like there's no real we can operate without it Teeth ultimately fine. right yeah the appropriations are really easy. yeah well no we have to have it um we're supposed to have it i suppose if we if we didn't and the appropriators just appropriated money that's called authorization by appropriation because ultimately both documents are passed okay. and signed into law so that like if the president if you know if the House and the Senate pass a bill and the president signs it, then it's law and like we have the money so we can execute. Um, they, in, in DC, they talk about the NDAA as a must pass bill. So that's why you see a lot of like random stuff get attached to the NDAA because it's one of the few things that you can count on as passing. Yeah. So people will try to make things sort of tangentially related to the Department of Defense that like aren't, but they still get passed and then everybody's happy, you know, because they get their thing passed. Yeah. Yeah. Got to play the game. The uh, one thing. Yeah. Kind of going to the other end of this. So we're talking about how the money gets allocated, but we've all seen it where at the end of the year, it's like use or lose money. Like we have to spend this money or it's gone. Like one, is that truly the reality? Like, is all of this at, you know, the bottom line is like, if you don't spend this, we take this away next year or like what drives that? And then is there any alternative to that that we're unaware of? So, yeah. And, and I'll try not to digress into irrelevancies about colors of money. So it, there, there are different time limits for how long you have to spend money appropriated for different things. So operations and maintenance is what they call one year money. So you have to spend it that year. So, so Congress isn't going to go as far as I can tell, isn't going to go, Oh, the, you know, X fighter squadron didn't spend all their money. We're going to give them less. That, that decision is going to happen sooner because there's always people who want to increase things. So you're, you never want to be an easy target for an offset. So mm -hmm. ACC is going to go, Oh no, I don't want my budget cut because we didn't spend our O&M money. So if we don't spend our O&M money this year, then maybe in the engine room, they'll go like, oh, look at that. They've got 50 million extra dollars. I'm going to take that 50 million extra dollars and apply it to this other thing that, you know, General Brown or whoever said was really important and we had to find money for it. So it's not a, it, it is legally required. Yes, you can't carry it over across fiscal years with some exceptions. So yes, it is use or lose in that sense. But then the fear, my opinion, I don't know this to be fact, but my opinion is that the fear of not getting it next year is more from the internal Air Force process versus the legislative process. That makes sense because they're trying to find free cash. And if you're the low hanging fruit, then that's going to be easy to, to take from. Yeah, like any good fighter pilot, you never want to highlight yourself negatively. So that's like a way to highlight yourself negatively. Yeah. The uh, one thing we saw on the merge, Bender and I were talking about this and we talked a little bit previously about it, but was the, uh, the bonus. So the pilot take rate bonus and the, uh, was it technically it's the aviation bonus? Uh, cause mm -hmm. all aviation can get a bonus. Uh, but what do you, cause they're trying to change it now. What do you know about all that? 
Yeah, um, so I think it's pretty exciting. Um, it, it looks like some new authorities were, are, are gonna be granted to the Air Force to get a little bit more creative with their retention efforts. So the backstory is that, you know, over the past, at least as long as I've been paying attention, so six to nine years or so, the Air Force has known that we're gonna have a fighter pilot shortage. Uh, and when I look back, I go, well, you know, in about 2006, we made some decisions to close fighter squadrons at Luke. We had an Eagle break in half in Missouri, so nobody could fly F-15s for a while. And we divested a bunch of F-16 squadrons. And so we basically didn't make any fighter pilots for like two years between 2007 and 2008. And then once we started making them again, oh, by the way, the A-10 was going through its C model upgrade. So very few people could go to A-10B course. So there's like a three year period where we didn't make a ton of fighter pilots. Oh, by the way, when we could make them, we could make fewer because we had fewer places to train them. Oh, by the way, once they were trained, we had fewer places to keep them flying. And so they were getting out. And oh, by the way, the airlines are hiring like gangbusters. And so people are bailing to get out and join the airlines. So back in the nineties, this also happened. And that's when the aviation retention bonus was initiated. I forget which year, I think 92 or 93, something like that, at $25,000 a year, which is a pretty good amount of money 30 years ago. Well, the Air Force hadn't yeah. increased the bonus until 2016 when they raised it to $35,000. And the reason is because it was capped in federal law by Congress at $25,000 and nobody had really gotten it to the point, you know, the Air Force had done a bunch of things to their credit recently with contractors and fighter squadrons and trying to make, you know, improvements in the margin, incremental improvements in the margins. And back in 2016, a couple of senators had a sit down to include uh, Senator McCain with some Air Force pilots. And they said, what, what do you want to stay in the Air Force? And what the pilot said was, well, we want to fly more. All we care about is flying. Flanders opinion is they asked the wrong pilot. So they asked six and seven year captains, not 12 and 13 year majors who were at the point of making that decision, who were probably in their mid thirties, probably married, likely with children. And if they'd been flying fighters for 12 or 13 years, their backs hurt and they're tired and flying fighters was no longer as novel and exciting as it was when they were 28, 29 with their hair on fire. And it's slowly become more of a job, right? So, I mean, that happened to me. I, I remember distinctly being tired and not wanting to go flying a, fly a fighter jet and going, what is wrong with me? Why, why am I feeling like this? So what those guys said was it's not about the money, which put a multi-year delay on increase in the money. So 2016, they raised it $35,000. So that's kind of the backstory. Now, 2022, what's in the bill? Um, and it's, it's in the NDAA on both the House and the Senate. Um, which means it's almost certainly going to be in the final version and almost certainly going to be law is the ability. So first of all, it raises the max bonus to $50,000 from 35. Uh, and then it allows the Air Force to offer that bonus prior to the end of the initial commitment. So one to three years prior to the end of the initial commitment and use uh, preferential or assignment preference, so base of preference. So the actual language is a five-year experimentation program, I assume, because whoever wrote it didn't want to call it a pilot program for pilot retention, because it's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> so the goal is to be able to appeal to different things for different people. So if you care a lot about where you live, for family reasons, maybe you have a spouse with a, you know, who's a lawyer or a doctor and you don't want to move to another state where they have to take boards, or maybe you are an EFMP and, you know, your, your child has a uh, primary care person that they're really clicking with and you just don't want to move. So you want to just stay put. And if you, you would be happy to stay on active duty, you just need to stay put. Great. There's a path for that. Or, Maybe you're a confirmed bachelor or bachelorette and you love your meme stocks and your Dogecoin and you just want 50 grand extra. And so I don't care where you assign me. 
I'll go news to the Air Force. Send me to Korea. I don't care. Send me to whatever, Saudi. I don't care. But pay me $50,000 a year extra because I really, really care about money. And oh, by the way, one to three years prior to the end of the service commitment for most people, not late rated, but most people who go to power training as lieutenants, you're still a captain. So $35,000 a year as a senior captain represents a larger portion of your total compensation than it does when you're a mid-career major. So in other words, the money hits harder. If you are if you had said to 30-year-old single slander, hey, bro, I'll give you 30 grand a year extra starting right now, and you sign a six-year contract that brings you to 15 years service, what do you, th- what do you say? Like, well, okay, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Um, and so the, I think the intent is to give the Air Force authorities to have a more tailored approach to different people. So rather than one memo that comes out in January and says, here's the bonus, take it or leave it, they go, okay, for the F-16 community, we can accept 20 guys, worst case, who all want to go to Aviano or Spangdalem in this year group. Great. So we're going to say there's 20 base of preference contracts and we're going to offer X number of dollars for that. Then another tier of contracts, perhaps it's like, Hey man, like you get access to talent marketplace, you get a say, and we'll give you a little bit more money because you have a little bit less control over your life. And that's likely the preponderance of contracts. And then a final category of, I don't care where I go. I'll go full needs of the air force and you give me $50,000 a year. So that, that's, that's Slander's opinion, reading the tea leaves. What the, what the law says is, hey, Air Force, you have one year to figure it out. Come back and report back to Congress what your decision is. Um, and, you know, ho- hopefully the Air Force is working on it now and considering that in their fiscal year 24 budget so that they don't come back and go, well, you know, here's our plan, but, oh, oops, we didn't budget for it. Whoopsie doopsie. Uh, we can't do this until <laughs> FY25. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I think that's a great, a much better way to approach it because I think a lot of people, and some people, they didn't think about getting out until the day they were getting out. Uh, but a lot of people are kind of making that assessment, thinking about that two, three years prior. So it makes sense to give the Air Force that latitude of, hey, two years out, this guy, he's just pinning on major he may be, you know, high, high risk for going to Korea or whatever a bad deal assignment would be, but a, a bonus may provide that incentive that the dude will take that assignment. And I feel like there's, there's so many anecdotal, so much anecdotal evidence of people kind of getting hosed out there, uh, either by assignments or taking the bonus and then getting a bad assignment, uh, where if, if you can say, Hey, I, I, I'll take a little less money to ensure I have quality of life because my kids are, you know, junior high into high school and I want to be able to let them stay somewhere. Uh, I think that's, I think that's good. So I, I'm glad that stuff's being created. Yeah. You know, I think it's, so, it's exciting to see people care about it on the Hill um, and, and want to do that. And, you know, it, it's interesting to see the legislature be sort of directive to the air force, like thou shalt do this because, you know, that's sort of Congress's way of saying, well, we've given you a few years and you haven't figured it out and it's not getting better. So we're going to help solve this problem for you. Hey, what were you going to say, Ben? Oh, I was going to say it's, um, it is just interesting that the flexibility that you kind of incorporate really that it just, it's just a new way of thinking of stuff. And I remember when that, I mean, they put together the air crew task force, I think it was called, right. And their whole mission yeah, statement like that. of that. Yeah, it's still there, right? But I remember when they first started the road shows, they were like, we want to, like, give us the feedback. We want to completely redesign the fighter enterprise in the United States Air Force. Like, what do we got to do to, like, correct this thing? And then the first report back that they came up with, like, with all this, like, we're going to, like, do all this cool stuff. And then the first slideshow we got, this isn't a hit on them or whatever. I think it's more speaks to the culture of Air Force leadership, maybe, or at least the bureaucracy. But it was like these little tiny nibbles on the, it was like, oh, you can turn down school if you want, or like, and it was just these things. And everybody's like this, like a year of effort to redesign all these problems that we have. 
and the best we got is like I get to turn down school if I don't want it you know like so I I think yeah and I, and I you know I, you gotta eat an elephant one bite at a time right so so making making changes on the margins and my my opinion is that those efforts especially the contractors and fighter squadrons to help take some of the administrative load off of fighter pilots so to speak um I, I think that was really good. And I think the effort that those that team has done is is valiant. I, I think frankly some of their hands were tied by the yeah. law. You know, yeah, hey, I don't wanna do this. I'm definitely not and Yeah. Sorry. So so that that was kind of something I was thinking about what I wanted to talk to you guys about. And one of the things that I, I learned that I would never have guessed is, you know, when you're down in the trenches, you know, having a beer or a, or Coke at the bar with the bros kind of complaining about, oh, Congress just doesn't get it. When the, when the department doesn't want something, typically they get what they want. So suppose you're working on the Hill and you've got a brilliant plan, you've got a great idea and you wanna get it put into the NDA. It's, it's a pretty difficult hill to climb. So step one is convincing your office it's a good idea. So, you know, whatever depending on how that dynamic is fine the next thing that's going to happen is you have to go to your professional staff member on the committee and convince that person that's a good idea usually that person's first question is well, what does the department think and so there's a formal process where officers on the hill can send legislative ideas back to the department of defense or the air force or navy or whoever and get an opinion and it's called the informal view and they go hey you know, essentially you get a concur, a non-concur, a concur with edits. Uh, and they basically say, here's what we think. We like it or we hate it, or we don't care, or we like it if you would make these changes. Getting something passed over, getting something into a bill over a non-concur is possible, but challenging. So once you get the PSM on board, once you get the department on board, now you gotta go find somebody in the other political party who also thinks it's a good idea because then it's an easier non-controversial thing to go in the bill great now you've done it on one side of congress you got to go find some friends and allies to do all that same thing on the other the other chamber so I, I work in the senate office so you know we we would do that for stuff on the senate side and then you start calling friends and allies on the house side and they would have to repeat the same process so get their psm on board find somebody in the opposing political party who thinks it's a good idea, their office thinks it's a good idea, convince both sides of the PSM, majority and minority, and then maybe it'll go in the bill. But if the department doesn't like it, they, they are legally not allowed to lobby, but they can say, we do not concur with this and here's why. And if it's a big enough deal, it'll go all the way up to what's called a statement of administrative policy that the president signs, which could include a veto threat. So the last NDAA that President Trump signed, he vetoed, because he was very upset that it included a provision that we're going to rename the bases that were named after Confederate, Confederate generals. So he said, I'm going to veto this bill if you don't take it out. And Congress was like, okay, they passed it. He vetoed it and they overrode his veto. So it's hard. You can do it, but it's hard. So the, the thing that I would say is maybe we need to look at ourselves and blame ourselves for some of the policies we don't like more than we need to look to Congress because my my opinion is that everybody wants to help. Everybody is, you know, a hardworking, patriotic, good person who wants to make things better. Frequently they don't know what they don't know. So if you don't if your if your Hill staff doesn't know what what is grinding your gears, they, they aren't able to help. And if it's grinding your gears, but there's a bigger strategic issue, then maybe the department says, Yep, we know it's kind of crappy but you know tough deal with it and so that that's kind of the give and take um that I, I think is important to understand that it's usually not a vindictive legislator who's out to like make your life miserable it's it's almost always good intent trying to improve national security make america better you know and all of that yeah i think i uh... think Oh. Sorry. Yeah, I. If I were to check Spears, it would not be towards Congress, even though I'm sure 
whatever. There's plenty of room for oh, everybody. Don't, don't worry. Me. There's plenty of spirits to chill. Yeah. <laughs> but I, well, I mean, I get the sense from you, which I think is awesome. And talking about the pilot retention uh, efforts, I think you're right. I, and I think we see like there are efforts, there are pushes to make us more agile, more innovative. I mean, that's what this podcast is all about, like the, the benefits of the cyber programs and stuff that we we're seeing. So I think you're... I totally buy it. Like that people want to help. They're like, there's tons of efforts going in, like the stuff that you're doing day to day, um, trying to make things better, not just for fighter pilots, but for, you know, the general big picture. I think that's awesome. And it's just frustrating to see that there's, you know, we call it the frozen middle or whatever, right? That's like the, the coin term, but there's just this bureaucratic, like massive, I don't even know, this giant goiter that sits on the department of the air force or whatever. We just can't get past certain things. And I think it's awesome to hear stories about like you're sitting in a bar and you're like, hey, what if laser rockets, like what if we could shoot down a cruise missile with a laser rocket? And then you went and tested, like, that's freaking awesome. And if the Air Force could find a way, you know, to like empower all these super smart people like you and Rex and, you know, to like solve the little problems that we see or they at least funnel up our solutions to the problems, you know, we, we could be so much better than we are, you know, and I think a lot of the frustrations Maybe we get over them or at least feel like we're like part of the fight. A lot of times I don't feel like we're part of the fight. You know, I'm just like, I'm just on the receiving end of all these bad ideas of my eval and my fitness and all this bull crap that we deal with it. We just know it's just terrible. Like I'm part of an organization that I like, can't get out of its own way. And that's, you know, it's tough to live like that for a long yeah, time. Yeah. One of the, I, yeah, I totally agree with you, Bender. And, and one of the things that, I learned in OT is never accept a no from someone who can't tell you yes. So like it's that. always easier to say no if you are in a position where saying yes would require a little bit more work, right? So back to the laser rocket test, plenty of people said, well, we've never done that before. How, how can we create a weapons footprint for that? It doesn't exist. I'm like, yeah. We're taking an air-to-ground weapon and trying to use it for air-to-air. Nobody knows what's going to happen. That's why it's a test. Well, I don't know how to do that. Like, oh, okay, fine. Can we use the AIM-9 mic? Like, this thing is way less capable than AIM-9 mic. Can we just use that instead? Well, I don't know. We need a waiver. Great. How do I write the waiver and who's it to? You just, you just have to, like, keep pushing. And even when somebody says something like, oh, well, I don't know. We have to ask the wing commander. Like, great, let's ask him. That's his or her job to make those decisions. Let's give them the opportunity to do so. You are not that wing commander. <laughs> yeah, the I think one of the things that I, when Bender and I were young and in Slander, maybe you were in the same boat, you know, it was all about flying jets. It was, hey, there's a staff tour. You can be an aide or you can do any of those. And it was like, not a chance. I am definitely not doing that. And then what you realize now, you know, old Vader and now Slander, you're actually in some of these positions, is that's really where you make the difference. And Paco and I talked about this a little bit uh, on the podcast that getting in the position you are now, you can make more change than you could being in a fighter squad. And even as a tier one or a tier two patch, like the impact that you can make for your bros today and in five years and in 10 years is so much more massive than being, and this is not a slight to line IPs, but being a line IPs or, or you know, a line patch, it's, it's just different. It's like orders of magnitude different to what you can actually impact for people and the, the spectrum or the, the aperture of the amount of people you can actually reach. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. And that's something I learned at OT as well is, you know, the, the impact that operational test has is for every F-16 pilot, and in some cases, multiple MDSs. And that is really, really satisfying. You know, I, I had some of the most professionally satisfying experiences of my career when I was deployed with the gamblers, you know, things like planning a cast mission with the special operators, going to execute the cast mission, successfully completing it, coming back and having a pancake breakfast with the same guys. And they say like, hey man, thanks for dropping that bomb. You really saved our rear ends. Like that's pretty awesome, right? So I, I've been fortunate to have that experience and to then have a different type of professional satisfaction in solving a problem that 
a lot of people are frustrated by and then getting the opportunity to go out to the cap and say, hey, here's the new stuff that we have for you. And like, here's why it's better and your life will be improved, et cetera. That's really satisfying. So, so do I miss flying airplanes? Yes, a thousand percent. Afterburners are objectively awesome and not getting the chance to light one a couple times a week is a bummer. The ability to hopefully make things a little bit better for others uh, in this job or, or my next job or whatever, that is also very motivational. And by the way, a lot of staff jobs get the bad rap of, oh my gosh, I'm going to be, you know, changing fonts and whatever on PowerPoint. Yeah, that is probably true. But the work-life balance in many staff jobs is also pretty nice. You know what's nice? Not hot pitting seed sorties on an upgrade ride <laughs> three days a week. Yeah, in the South Not Carolina having 14, 15 hour days, uh, you know, six days a week in preparation. Not not going to Nellis every month for a month for six months on and off. Like that that is a that is a grind. And so for for guys that are kind of on the fence about like, ah, oh, man, the staff, oh, the staff is lame. I don't want to do it. Like, yeah, it is. But there's also some good parts, and you get to you get to influence things on a on a grander scale. Even it's sort of irrelevant where your staff job is, whether it's Magcom or at the half or wherever. There's always going to be something that you can do to make life better for the bros in the trenches to hopefully make those 16-hour days not 16 hours, or at least make those 16-hour days worthwhile and not we're just going to burn the flying hour program because we're going to we're going to go do it for whatever reason yeah. you know one question i have so that, is uh oh go ahead no that's it that's, that's that's my motivation to keep keep trying this maybe i can make it better for the bros and, yeah and i think you are i that. mean yeah. knowing you from being a squadron patch to going to test to now i mean it seems like across the board i mean we ran into each other at warfighter in savannah and uh you know just hearing the stuff you were working on and then now seeing some of that stuff you know kind of come to fruition it's cool because like you said you are making an impact uh one thing that we keep hearing obviously the retention side of this and then it's almost like some situations, the Air Force, whether it's in their control or not, they kind of cut off their nose despite their face. Because I have guys, I have friends who are majors, haven't taken a bonus, they can leave, and they say, I will go to any school, just not Maxwell. And they're like, Maxwell, you're hired. And you're like, man, that is... It's just tough because you see them. These guys are, I mean, they're getting strats off the base. They're, they're number ones, number twos off of an Air Force base with tons of IPs uh, like a Holloman. And they say, like, hey, I will go wherever you want. I just don't want to take my family back to Maxwell. And they do it again. And it sounds like this new aviation uh, bonus stuff may alleviate some of that. But why do you think that happens today or has happened in the past where good dudes who want to stay in literally get pushed out of the active duty side into the garden reserve? Um, so the first thing I would say is something that uh, a mentor of mine, Kaloa Chalk, told me as we were, as I was putting my my school list together, he said, hey man, just remember, when the initial school list drops, that's a draft. You You can get swapped to another school, just like, which is exactly what happened to me. It's like, texted him when it happened. I was like, hey man, you're 100% right. So, you know, when folks get that Maxwell assignment and they're like, ah, dude, I don't want to go back to Montgomery. I, that's why, you know, we talked earlier about, well, the ability to decline school later is kind of like per, on the periphery. Like, I don't agree. I think that is a huge improvement because you can wait to sign your bonus until the school list comes out and you're like, oh, all right yeah, I can party with that. And then you go, well, I, mean, I might even change, right? Um, so so, so that's kind of one side of it. I, the way that the Air Force does schools is an absolute black container mystery to me. You know, you like, you like hit ready, set, go on your form and then your wing commander changes all of your, your self-love uh, on your push line and 
I don't know, man, it goes, it goes away into never, never land and comes back and you're like, Oh, okay. Interesting. I'm going to this place like dope or boo or whatever. Right. So I think that kind of speaks to a, an opportunity for transparency and maybe, maybe it's obvious and it's sitting somewhere on one of the new websites that I haven't logged into for nine months. Cause I don't have an air force computer, which is bragging. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also, I think that the Air Force, especially the fighter pilot community, I, I think we could do a lot better job with candid professional feedback. We pride ourselves on the debrief culture, and then guys are shocked when they barely make promotion to lieutenant colonel. And it's like, well, yeah, dude, like you didn't do any of the stuff you had to do. Like being a line IP and flying and only flying upgrade sorties is awesome. But like at some point in your military career, you stop being the the tactical juggernaut and you start being a leader. And if all you want to do is be a tactical juggernaut, like there are opportunities for that in the Guard and Reserve. And it's awesome that we have those opportunities. And I, I know you guys are there and that's great. But if you want to stay on active duty, like you, you have to be honest with yourself that at some point, like, bro, you're not flying four days a week and going to make 06. Yeah. And you may not even make 05 if you're not doing the stuff that gets you out of the squadron because it's not going to separate you from your peers. So I think that the change promotion categories was a really, really good move. I think the um, abolishment of below the zone for Lieutenant Colonel was a brilliant move. We could probably debate about it for 06, um, but at least 05, I think getting rid of it was good because dudes, like not everybody is in the top 5% of officers who's going to be below the zone or the top 2% for two below the zone, but everybody thought they were, and everybody was trying to get the coveted shoe flag DG at Maxwell the first time. So they could be on the, on the HPO track. And it was, in my opinion, damaging to the air force as a whole, because we all thought we were going to be in the top 5%, but 95% of us weren't. So now we have the opportunity to have these conversations and it's hard in fighter squadrons to go like, hey, man, you're a great instructor pilot. You are not a great officer. And here's how you're going to do better. And so the same thing with the new stratification guidance that came out, where if you're going to put in a Looney Tunes strat, like my number one IP with red hair on a Tuesday, like <laughs> you also have to put in the actual strat of where that person is. You know, she is my number three of 20 CGOs. Like, okay, cool. So now you know whether your commander has the stones to tell you face to face or you just see it on your OPR is separate. Hopefully the commander is talking to you about it. So you're not surprised when you see your, your strat, but you know, to your point about like, how come this guy or this gal is getting a school that he or she didn't want probably because they never knew that they weren't as awesome as they thought they were. <laughs> and nobody ever told them like, Yes, you're very special. We're all special snowflakes and we worked really hard 12 years ago in pilot training to get fighters. Guess what, dude? Like that doesn't matter anymore. What matters is what you've done for me lately in the last five years. And so if what you've done for me lately in the last five years is like consistent mediocrity, you're probably not going to go to school. And yeah. like that shouldn't be a surprise to people. Well, and that's one of the things that, it, it, again, a lot of this is anecdotal because it's just dudes I knew. Um, but some guys who had a more desirable pedigree were getting worse schools than the guys who had a worse track record because they went and worked at the wing. And then yeah. they were like, well, he needs that school because that's going to look better where this guy has already demonstrated. He's a, he's like a shining star officer so he can go to a worse school. And you're like, this is like, it doesn't seem great, but again, like that's, that's a one-off. I think the majority of the situations are what you're talking about where it's like, I, I don't think I ever got formal, honest feedback for my officership and, or my fighter pilotness more than once or twice in 10 years. You know, a lot of times it was like, Hey, you BS in the bar, OPR comes around, you know, you write it and had my first couple bender, you know, wrote them for me. Uh, and then, mm. you know, they go up to the squadron commander and they move on and you read them as a guy who didn't, couldn't care less about OPRs. And I get them back and I'm like, man, those, those words sound nice. And then my squadron commander at Holloman is like, 
you have like no strats. And I was like, Oh, don't worry. I'm going to the guard. And he was like, well, okay, well that's fine. But so yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's just funny. Cause if you're not initiated, you don't even realize that they're pretty much saying like, eh, mediocre at best. And it, you know, but it's just different words saying that. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to give people negative feedback, especially when you can't point to things like in the debrief and go, Hey, amigo, your radar Mac here is a, is atrocious. And here's what the 3-1 says about how to do better. When you're like, hey, man, you ever heard a word called tack? I didn't think so, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's a much more difficult conversation to have. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about too is I, I know that like the Air Force has kind of said they really want Maxwell to be awesome. And so they're they're taking – guys that would typically go to, you know, sort of the more prestigious IDE programs and, and trying to get them to go to Maxwell to like make it better. And frankly, everyone I know who's been to Maxwell has said it's awesome because you go to work in the morning and you spend, you know, three or four hours in school, you go, you come home, you read a little bit, and then you like go coach your kid's t-ball team or soccer team. And you're never working on weekends and you're not stressed out and, you know, you're learning and you're having interesting conversations but you're also recharging and building up family time, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. That said, like I was not going to go to Maxwell Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> Recommend it for everyone. And that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I've seen some dudes kind of get their, their feelings hurt. You know, they went to Maxwell and again, like it's, it's a different time, like eight, eight ish years ago or when people were going to Maxwell and it was, if you turn it down, this is what was, what was the term when you, they used to, with prejudice, like you turn down school and it's like, that's it. You don't get another school slot. So it makes sense why people wouldn't turn down Maxwell because not everybody was getting spots. And if you did turn it down, it was game over. Uh, so I could see why that would be something that uh, would cause people to, to go to Maxwell more than they do today because they have choices. Um, yeah, well, and and the option was go to Maxwell or separate. And by the way, you have five days. So yeah, like, yeah. hope you thought about this. You know. <laughs> yeah, that hopefully it seems like they we've made progress. You know, the the Air Force that was around in the two thousands and then two thousand ten and then today. I mean, it, it is a different organization. So hopefully, we keep making progress with dudes like yourself doing good work up at uh, up at the Capitol and. And hopefully, do you know what you want to do after this, or do you know what's what's on deck? Um, so not officially, no. I strongly desire to get back to operational test. Um, I, I feel like I've kind of punched my cap card, uh, and the the work in OT is really fascinating to me. You know, I, I got an engineering degree in undergrad, so I enjoyed geeking out and nerding out and talking to the engineers. And then sort of translating that into fighter pilot speak is something that's really fun. Um, I realized if I went back, I'd probably be on a leadership track, so I wouldn't get to be doing that as much. But kicking down doors and making relationships around the Air Force to make it easier for younger versions of what I was that are probably better and smarter and more enterprising to, to enable them to make improvements, like that's pretty exciting to me. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the Pentagon and, uh, the secretary of the air force as legislative liaison shop will be an action officer for a year, uh, or so I uh, assume based on my timeline. And then, you know, hopefully a TX and back to Eglin, uh, would be, would be my hope. We'll, we'll see if it comes to fruition. <laughs> yeah. You want to go back to the Viper side or are you going to try to TX into the 35? Uh, I, I'd prefer to stay in the Viper. Um, yeah, F-35 is an vendor. amazing aircraft. I, I have a lot of respect for the guys that fly it. I know it's the future. I, quite frankly, am too lazy to go learn a new airplane and then suffer through more upgrades. Uh, I just don't want to do it. <laughs> I'd rather focus that energy elsewhere. Well, uh, so one one last question, and Bender, I'll let you ask a question if you have one. But uh, So the Sibber topic is uh, floating around the uh, Senate and Congress right now, whether to continue or not continue. Uh, do you have any insight on that or, or your perspective on the innovation, small business innovation research stuff? Um, not any specific insight. I would personally be shocked if it doesn't get renewed. It may not get renewed, you know, by October 1st, but 
Um, I know the department would like it. Uh, I know that the department's also got some other stuff going on with innovation, like the Raider project out of R&E, um, which I forget, research and design experimentation, something or else, something or other. And that they asked for like several hundred million dollars uh, for grant writing in that area. Um, I, I would be shocked if Saber Stutter didn't get renewed. Uh, I can't, I don't think it's in the NDAA, but I don't know why. Um, I'd have to double check, but not not any specific insight. I, everybody seems to like it. Uh, I think, you know, I know Paco's got some strong opinions about phase two transition and the valley of death and all that. I'm, I'm not well versed enough in those programs to have strong opinions. Um, and quite frankly, like sometimes the valley of death is a good thing because that's where bad ideas can go die. Yeah. <laughs> so it's okay. Um, yeah, so I, Flanders opinion, right? I don't, I haven't talked to any about this, but I think Sibber is going to be fine. I think yeah. they'll renew it. There might be some, some incremental improvements. I think that's good because I think it needs to improve. It's, it's we're not ignorant enough to believe that it's it's a perfect program. So hopefully, if there are changes, they're they're in the right direction. Bender, what do you got for yeah. Slender before he goes? Uh, I I just, I don't have any specific questions. I would like to know when you've solved the uh, human resource issue at the Pentagon. Why there are so many civilians running around with computers these days? So once you've solved that, yeah. we'll get you back on the podcast. Talk all about. Yeah. You know, pin on your Medal of Honor, all that stuff would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are, you are not the only one with strong opinions about the quantity of DOD civilians in the Pentagon and outside the Pentagon. That That's a tough, that's a tough problem to solve. But, you know, I, I think, I don't think that the Department of Defense's processes have really been closely looked at since the drawdown in the 90s um, in terms of like how many fewer people we have and how many organizations still exist. So I think there's a mismatch with the number of things that we're being asked to do with the number of humans available to do it. Um, and also like, man, we have so many general officers. We have more general officers now than we did in World War II. Like there are so many. And with every GO comes a huge tail of support. Even if they're, you know, a lowly one star in the Pentagon, they're still going to have a couple folks that are on their team, you know, and wh why do we have one stars that are executive officers in the Pentagon? Yeah. Like, that's crazy to me. So, yeah. no, like, I... that general officer should be out leading troops or airmen or guardians or whatever, right? Like, sitting around and BSing with the, undersecretary of whatever while refilling the coffee maker is like not the best use of that person's time, I think. Well, I think, I, I think it, it almost is creates its own problem is we, you have to have this pedigree and you have to have all these, you know, accolades and check these, all, all these containers. And what you end up doing is people have to go do these things, whether they're needed or not, because they can't get career progression without it. Um, well, yeah, I agree. I think there is absolutely value in a general being around other senior leaders who are more senior to that person from sort of informal mentorship right if you're if you're in the room with the undersecretary for policy or the deputy under for whatever and you have a conversation with that person just off the cuff you know what what are you thinking about dr hicks about this like that, that is very useful. Uh, even if it's just, I'm going to, I'm going to learn a little bit about how senior civilian leaders think about dealing with Congress and think about using press releases as a political tool to advance my agenda, which some of them are doing very well and some of them are not. Um, yeah. So I, I think there's value. I think we do an awful lot of it where we may not need to. Yeah. 
Well, awesome. Well, I, Slander, I appreciate you coming out again and, uh, and chatting with us, spending all the time. Everybody, uh, remember, contact us at info at KodiakShack.com if we want to be on the show uh, or just tell us how good or bad we're doing. Uh, and check out our website, KodiakShack.com. Uh, the testimonials are, are up. And uh, please like, share, uh, subscribe, do whatever the uh, platform you're on allows you to do. Uh, thanks again, Slander. See ya. Thanks, guys. See ya. See you, man.